Yes, it's recording. Did Bill raise his hand? I did. Yes, Bill, go ahead. I have a question from last week. Yes. You talked about verse 27. Let me go to verse 27. Yes. In that verse, it said all action is done by property. Yes. By the, not by this individual self. That's right. Whereas Sri Ramakrishna constantly says, I'm a yantra, to me yantri. Yes. I mean, you are the, you operate the machine. Yes. How do you reconcile these two ways of putting it? When we identify with the uh, body and mind, as we usually do, we don't say that I'm switching to body and mind identification now, but that's our, our default mode as it were. We think we are this person. And here the primary delusion is, I am in charge, I do actions, and this is my body, this is my mind. We'll talk about this today, actually it'll come up. And these are meant for my purposes, and I am, I am acting through them. And this is actually a, a very big mistake, because almost everything here in the world and in our body, I mean, just this biological machine, almost everything going on here is being done by Prakriti, by nature. There's almost very little that we are directly in charge of. I mean, all the things that are going on in the organ systems, in the tissues, in the cells of our body, we would be immediately overwhelmed if we were put in charge. I mean, if nature says, okay, you drive, you think you're going to do a better job than me? We're going to die within minutes. I mean, probably have to call an ambulance. <laughs> It'll kill us faster than uh, the COVID-19, uh, trying to run our body by ourselves. The similarly for our minds too, where our thoughts, impulses, memories and desires bubble up from, and then we think, I want, I like this, I hate that. And then we act upon it. All of it thinking that we are doing it. And yet behind the, uh, behind the scene, there is uh, nature. Mother nature is doing all of this right now. Acknowledging this at this level, then we must say, thou art, art doing everything. And this is a, a much better way of saying this uh, than, uh, you know, the mother nature does everything. Um, Thou art uh, the controller, I am just a machine in your hands. That's, that's an attitude which Sri Ramakrishna liked. Uh, he said it's, it's much better, thou, not, not I. Which is actually a more practical, more true thing to say right now. Than to say the next step, you know, what they are saying here that you are the witness. Prakriti does everything and you are the witness. Uh, you are the witness consciousness. Um, that's the next step. Uh, I am consciousness, I am the witness, is something that comes only when the mind has been purified enough to see this as the truth. Right now, it's just a concept for me. Uh, right now, it's much better to first recognize that whatever is going on in my life, I have so little control over it. Yes, I do something. I have free will. But a lot is done by God, by nature, whatever you say. And to recognize that is that, uh, is Sri Ramakrishna's attitude, saying that thou art the operator and the machine, uh, I am the house and thou art the one who stays in the house, and things like that. I am the chariot and thou art the drive, driver of the chariot. Uh, that's a bhava, a spiritual attitude, which actually is, which tallies with what the Bhagavad Gita says. Is that what you wanted to ask? Yes, it's, you know, it seems that the gunas are so impersonal, that God is personal. Yes. Uh, but you're saying they're equivalent, that God is running the gunas. Yes, the gunas belong to God. The gunas, the sattva, rajas, tamas, they are constituents of prakriti, of nature. If you ask how, what is going on here, even from a scientific perspective, it's nature. It, I mean, um, biologically and physically outside, uh, it's nature doing just about everything here. Now, if you ask what is nature? So nature is the power of God. Beyond nature, there is God. Um, nature is Prakriti or Maya. And uh, God is Ishwara, the one who wields this Maya. We are under, under the domain of Maya, but Maya is under the control of God. So, yes, it's nature. It's the Gunas who are, which is doing everything to begin with. But the Gunas are nothing other than Prakriti or nature. And Prakriti is nothing other than the power of God. So, ultimately, if one says... No, I think God is doing everything. You would be right. 
you'd be right. But through nature. Um, so how, if you say, how do I know that God is doing things? Where do I see God? I don't see God. I don't even see God acting. Look, but you do see nature acting. Um, this body, uh, for example, uh, you know, really we say this is mine and I'm in charge of this. And as, as I said, there's very little going on here in which I am in charge of. Even if I say it's mine, in what sense is it mine? I mean, one Swami put it in a humorous way. He said, um, show me your papers to show who gave you the body. Where, are the, where is the papers saying that you own the body? Um, did somebody give it to you as a gift? No. Um, did you make it? No. Do you own the materials out of which it is made? The, the sky and fire and air and water and earth? No. Um, does it obey you? No, it doesn't. Thank God it doesn't. Uh, so, in what sense is it mine? It's just about virtually no sense. It's more like that story of uh, that uh, man who was galloping through the village on a horse, uh, looking very serious, you know, charging through the village. And the villager asked, Sir, where are you off to? And the man galloped past and he looked back and shouting, I don't know, ask the horse. <laughs> So we are on this horse, we are on, uh, on a journey, but we are really, very little of it is uh, in our control. To recognize that, to say that the gunas are working, to say that Prakriti is working, and to say ultimately it is God who is in charge, is to recognize the truth. To recognize the truth. I am Brahman, that's a far cry. Uh, I was reading somewhere that Sri Ramakrishna saw, somebody was chanting, Soham, I am he, I am that. Sri Ramakrishna observed this and he said, he went and scolded him and said, um, what is this? First say, not I but thou, Naham, not me, thou my lord. First do this and then when the mind is purified, then the next thing will come. He didn't say that but he just said, don't say I, I am he, say thou, not me. So this is what is being said here. Uh, yes. All right, so that's a good good summary. But how do we go there? How do we get to this position? Um, the thirtieth verse, which we did last time, did we do the chant? The uh, we haven't done the Mangalacharam. Om Vasudeva Sutam Devam Kamsa Chanuramardhanam Devaki Paramanandam. Krishnam Vande Jagad Guru. Last time we did the 30th verse, which is very important. Uh, the 30th verse sums up the entire teaching of Karma Yoga, which Sri Krishna wants to teach in this third chapter. What was said in the 30th verse? Mai Sarvani Karmani Sanyasya Dhyatma Chetasa Nirashi Nirmamo Bhutva Yudhyas. Yudhyaswa Vigata Jwaraha Renouncing all actions in me uh, with a spiritual awareness or spiritual consciousness, giving up all desires and this idea of possession, do your duty, fight this battle, being free of all cares, of all anxiety uh, and stress. So this is the idea of this is the teaching of Karma Yoga. Notice the elements. First, Adhyatma Chetasa. Very important. The whole purpose is guided by the goal, a spiritual goal. The goal of human life is God-realization. My goal is God-realization. This must be acknowledged. Until we come to this, this uh, clear acknowledgement, uh, we are still uh, worldly in the sense that still the world is our goal. When we make God our goal, this is called Adhyatma Chetasa. Once I, I make up my mind, the goal of my life is God-realization. Or the goal of life is God-realization, I now acknowledge it. This is going to be my goal forever. Um, then how do I practice? What do I have to do now? Mai Sarvani Karmani Sanyasya. Action will go on. Work will go on. My life will go on. But now what I do is, this is no longer for my own sake or for, for my own little purposes. All work is now worship of God. In whichever form you love God, 
uh, as Krishna or Rama, uh, as Shiva or uh, Durga or Kali or Vishnu, uh, as Allah or as our Father in Heaven or Jehovah, in whichever form you worship God, I offer all my actions. Why all actions? Religious actions and secular, so-called secular actions. You see, before this what was happening, secular actions are of course for me and even the so-called religious actions which I performed, going to temple and church, doing rituals, they were basically for improving my worldly life. Uh, I, I, God will bless me, my life will go well and that, will, that is the purpose. My life will go well, that becomes the purpose and God is a help. God helps me to take care of my day-to-day -day life. That's still worldly. This is different. Now once we have got the the ultimate goal of God realization, now all my actions are for that purpose. So whatever I do, all my spiritual actions, my meditation, my repeating the mantra, my puja, my Gita study, uh, the service that I, that I, I uh, the money that I offer for good causes, whatever I do is now I'm worshiping my Lord. I'm offering just as you offer flowers in the shrine, I offer these uh, continuously throughout the day, sarvani karmani, both sec so-called secular and um, so-called religious. Now everything becomes spiritualized. Uh, there is, let there be no, no, no division between the secular and the sacred anymore. Then what else? Nirashi, without selfish desires. Till now all my karma had desires. May I be healthy and my, my own health, my family's uh, welfare, um, money and uh, pleasure and success, uh, all of these goals I had. And behind all of these goals was one purpose. I want to be happy. I want peace. I want ultimate lasting fulfillment. And since I'm not getting it through any of these means, uh, I have been pursuing these means for my whole life and we don't know how many lives. I'm not getting it. Now I have realized that actually God realization is the goal and I will get the same thing which I wanted, real peace, lasting joy and fulfillment. I will finally get it through God realization. So now not for my selfish desires. Things will still keep, still keep happening. As you work, you will get, get your salary, you will get uh, as you do good things, people will praise you. If you eat pleasant things, you will get pleasure. All of those results of actions will still keep coming to us. That, that will not stop. But the difference is this. Earlier, what was happening was, I was working hard to get certain things which I wanted. Uh, desirable things, pleasant things, nice things, which I thought would make me happy. And I was working to get those things. I was working to avoid things which I did not want. People I don't like, jobs I don't like, activities, food, all those things I'm trying to avoid because I thought I don't like that, that will give me, um, uh, it will be unpleasant and these are the things which I like, It'll be, it is pleasant, let me avoid this and let me pursue that. That's what I was doing till now. Now what happens is because all my karma is now worship of God, because I'm now offering everything as worship of God. When you offer something to God, uh, in Hindu pujas, you offer food to, to the Lord. And once you, when you offer food, the food which you offer to the Lord is called bhoga. When you offer it to the Lord, luckily for us, the Lord doesn't eat much. Whatever the Lord eats, we don't know, but uh, everything more or less comes back to us. And that is called prasada. Prasada. So in the worship of God, all actions, the results, all actions are now worship of God, puja. And all the result of action is now prasada. Earlier what was there? All actions were karma and the results of action were karma phala, good and bad. But now all actions are puja and all the results, the results will keep coming. The results are now prasada. In prasada, now I don't have likes or dislikes. When I go to a temple, after the puja, when the prasada is handed out, will I start picking? Give me the mango. I don't like the banana. No. Because it's, it's not a question of a mango or a banana or a pear anymore. It's a fruit which has been offered to the Lord and now it's the sanctified. Whatever comes to my hand, my whole idea is different now. Similarly, whatever is coming because of my past karma now, I will accept it as prasada. No longer are there 
specific selfish desires to fulfill this is the big idea behind nirashi no personal uh, selfish desires anymore it is all worship of the lord and whatever happens now is acceptable to me because it is all prasad it's all sanctified so karma and result of karma are replaced by worship and prasad the sanctified uh, you know offerings nirmama so this relates to what bill had asked a little while ago nirmama means not mine so till now i had thought all of this is mine and for me world for me body is mine and for my purposes now i realize none of it is mine nor is it for my purpose it is it all belongs to the lord and it is for god realization um nirmama and i realize as we we are talking uh, just a while ago nature does everything how little credit i can actually take if i am truthful even from the medical point of view even from a scientific point of view how little is under my control how little do i consciously do almost everything is done by nature so by the gunas of nature knowing this crediting god with it it's not mine it's thine as sri ramakrishna told that would be non dualist uh, scolded him no don't say i am he say not i but thou my lord so nirmama means that not mine not i thou my lord surrendering moment to moment our activities and the happenings of life to god now what do you do sit and meditate give up everything no yudhas yudhyaswa fight the battle of life family duties responsibilities job career community uh, as a human being in in the society of other beings whatever needs to be done whatever comes to you yeah. do the best what you can fight the battle of life but vigata jwaraha free of fever a very beautiful term free of fever free of anxiety when we are doing karma with desire there will always be anxiety there will be anxiety there will be fear stress terror temptation and that fever always we are in a fever in a mental fever here vigata jwara means absolutely free of anxiety everything that i do is the worship of the lord everything that happens is by the will of the lord my goal is the lord only none of this belongs to me even this life it belongs to the lord the world belongs to lord and i belong to the lord why why do i have to worry the one who has been running this world before my birth Uh, is running the world right now will keep on running the world after this particular little life of mine is over the ramakrishna anandaji ji was um, the disciple of sri ramakrishna and he started our uh, ashram in chennai in the ramakrishna mat in, in chennai so in the early days so there were many interesting incidents one day one gentleman came um, so he was um, interested in many social reform programs good good projects so he started telling sashi maharaj swami ramkrishna anji that this has to be done that has to be done and sashi maharaj calmly sat and listened and then after that he said i wonder what god did before you were born so <laughs> it, it is the lord's word the lord will do everything and through us also the god does things through people and through us the lord will do lord will do his work another beautiful incident uh, this is recorded by sister deva mata who is an american uh, sanyasin who went from uh, the united states in fact her ashram is close to um, the new york cohasset so she went from there to india in the early 20th century and uh, she lived for some time uh, in madras and she traveled to other places in india and uh, she observed Swami Ramakrishna Anji at close quarters. One day, Swami Ramakrishna Anji was telling her about his struggles in life, from his um, as a young monk after the passing of Sri Ramakrishna, the struggles he underwent, sacrifices in setting up the mo- monasteries in uh, in um, in Chennai, and so on. And Sister Deva Mata thought he she writes that I was. indignant that such a holy noble soul why does he have to suffer so much and i could not contain myself any more and i burst out said swami why do you have to suffer so much and the swami became uh, uh, you know uh, agitated and excited he said what what do you mean uh, this little life 
Let the Lord do with it what He will. My true life is eternal. My life is eternal. I am, I am the same. I mean, He didn't explain. My true life is eternal. This little life belongs to the Lord. Let Him do with it what He will. See, this is Vigata Jwara. Absolutely uh, without any anxiety or worry about it. Success, failure, uh, what have I achieved, what have I not achieved, did things go well, did not go well, it's not yours. It's none of it is ours. And that's a great relief. It's the Lord who will take care of things. Let us do our best. This is Karma Yoga. Um, I think, no, there was no hand. Right. Let us go on to the next verse. 31. So this is an important verse. 30th was a very important verse. It summarized the entire teaching and very practical also. Oh, there is a question. Jayant, would you call them out? Yes. Uh, Prabhi Babu, you, you're next. Please go ahead. Maharaj Pranam, uh, to, to have this kind of an attitude, uh, one has to first have real, uh, I don't know what, um, mentally it will be prepared. It's not easy for everyone to have this kind of attitude. What is the preparation? What is required to get to this kind of uh, state? As you said, one must have a mental preparation. Exactly. That's what we're talking about. Adhyatma Chetasa. You see, in the 30th verse, the key word, where do you begin? You begin with Adhyatma Chetasa. You don't begin with Mai Sarvani Karmani Sanyas. You're giving up all actions to me. No. Before that, one must first uh, have this clear, make a clear decision. What do I want in life? And I decide that I want God realization in life. Now it starts from there. That is the preparation. That much is enough. It will happen slowly. It's not that immediately one will become a karma yogi. But it will start from there. So, and don't worry. So, Prabir Babu is a very intense practitioner. So <laughs> he's always anxious whether I'm doing properly or not sadhana. Don't worry. We are all on the path. And we are all making progress. So we all have the Adhyatma Chaitasa, the, the spiritual orientation that I want God realization. Otherwise, uh, why would we be here for, uh, for the Gita class? That's why we are here. Um, uh, yes, anybody else? Yes, Maharaj. Uh, Gita Ji, you're next. Yeah, Pranam Swamiji. Namaskar. Um, this, uh, a verse you interpreted, it is, um, as I hear it, it's in, interpreted as um, surrender and completely Dvaita philosophy. How does an Advaita interpret the same verse? Same way. Remember, Dvaita is not against, Advaita is not against Dvaita. This is what we were discussing in the Mandukya class. Those who attend the Mandukya class, Gaurapada says, there is avivada, aviruddhascha. There is no contradiction of Advaita with any philosophy. Uh, so it is completely non-contradicted. So, what an Advaitin does is, Advaitin first makes a difference between um, the Paramarthika and the Vyavaharika. Vyavaharika means transactional. Here I am, this person in this body, this is my life, now what do I do? I have got the go goal of God realization. So, this is Vyavaharika, transactional. I read that I am Brahman, Aham Brahmasmi. Uh, the whole world, including this life, body and mind, everything is an appearance in Brahman, but I am that Brahman. I read all that. But right now, I am not there. There means I have not realized it. It's, if I had these questions, would not arise. I would not need any of this at all. The very fact that I need it means that I am on a spiritual journey to realize that Paramarthika Satyam, that ultimate truth. Now, at the Vyavaharika level, transactional level, I, I am a Jiva. Really, I am Brahman, but right now, for practical purposes, I am a Jiva because I have not yet realized it. Uh, so, as a Jiva, now what do I need to do? As a Jiva, I experience the world as dualistic and all dualistic practices become useful. So, we have discussed this earlier also. Shankaracharya's uh, structure of sadhana, spiritual practice, for, we need purification of mind. For purification of mind, so impure mind is the problem, pure mind is the solution. And the method for pure mind is karma yoga, this whole third chapter, this 30th verse for example. 
Is it dualistic? Yes, yes. Ultimately non-dualistic, but in appearance, practically, transactionally, em empirically, vyavaharika level, dualistic. Then next, with a pure mind, I need concentration. So, distraction of mind is the obstacle and concentrated mind is the solution. Method is upasana, meditation. So, um, yoga becomes useful. Again dualistic. And after that, with a pure and concentrated mind, when I come to Advaitic teachings, Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasa, and it flashes upon me, Aham Brahmasmi. When I realize that I am Brahman, only one thing has to be, and that is non-dualistic, but one thing has to be clear, when I felt it was dualistic, at that time the truth, philosophically speaking, technically speaking, it is actually non-dualistic. It's just that I don't realize it. It's better for me to keep the dualistic paradigm and practice accordingly, knowing, keeping in mind, holding on to the ultimate reality that it is non-dualistic ultimately. That Brahman is the only reality. Sri Ramakrishna said, hold on to the truth of Advaita. Then you practice everything else. Yeah. So this is the answer. Um, Dvaitic practices are entirely accepted by Shankaracharya. Only philosophically is Advaitic. And they lead to Advaitic conclusion and Advaitic enlightenment. There is one more question. Okay, let, let's take another question. Madhavji, you are next. Uh, Swamiji Pranam. Um, so, uh, my question is, actually, I saw your video uh, sometime before, where you were telling about the story of one Swami, who was a very nice, a very great mathematician, and uh, how you met him uh, while going in the morning, overnight he worked on one problem, and then he said to you that, how could I sleep? Yeah. Uh, before solving that problem, how can I sleep? Mm. So that was complete devotion in his head that uh, he was trying to solve one problem, dedicating it to God. And recently I was uh, looking to a uh, karma yoga lecture, which, which you recently gave it. And uh, I was listening to it. And there you told that you have to pull back as well at one point. So how to understand these two things? Because when, um, when I worked, I start com doing work with a dedication, with 100% concentration, I completely forget. This forgetfulness, how to realize that you have completely forget and then you have to pull back. Yes. Because uh, sometimes, time to time, this pulling back is, is missed out. I understand. Um, Swami Vivekananda had said, you must learn to empty the bucket. Empty the bucket means, is the secret of success is attachment and detachment. Completely pouring yourself into something. And at, yet and ready at the next moment to withdraw yourself completely. Now that sounds very difficult. First of all, our big problem is distraction. We are unable to give 100% to anything. Mind is continuously scattered and distracted. There is that example which I gave of the mathematician. is Mahan Maharaj who is a monk and a brilliant mathematician. Ex that was an example of concentration, of focus. So that focus is necessary in spiritual life. This means slowly we'll develop it. If you say something like that, people get disheartened that I don't have that kind of focus. We have some focus to begin with. So let's start there. But also step back from it. Um, uh, there is another level at which people can be very focused on a certain thing. Their favorite uh, activity or job or book or whatever it is. And unable to dissociate from it. And that leads to suffering. Um, so... Knowing that the mind is an instrument, I am not the mind. So when I put the mind to work on something, I am using the instrument for this. I am still separate from it. You don't have to think about it all the time. If you do, you cannot concentrate. But this knowledge has to be there. And so when the necessity comes for stepping back, you know that you are already separate from the mind. The mind which has been given to that job is something separate from me. And now I take it up from this job and I put it somewhere else. If I am totally identified with the mind, it will be very difficult to separate myself from what I am concentrating on. Because then it will be a, like, I am pulling myself apart and it will feel like that. Um, so this is one, actually it's a Sankhyan idea of uh, consciousness and its object. Yes, so attachment and detachment, these are two powers and both must be cultivated. But first is the power of, um, I won't call it attachment, focus. 
right now a big problem for most people is people lack focus very scattered that's where the mahan maharaj example came in but uh, swami ji um, there was a one thing as well because with tremendous uh, when somebody focuses too much on one thing mm. there is kind of attachment that is uh, that comes with it for example if i love my work too much mm. there is kind of even though i am at the end dedicating my work uh, yes. to the lord itself this is the idea that i started working yes but at after some point um you if that work is not completed for example then this kind of um this heartness uh, if i put it uh, in the right word this you feel very disheartened after right that. i understand what you're trying to say no the work has its own parameters of success so it must be done skillfully it must be done in time in budget it must be brought to a conclusion the result must come all of these are aspects of the work and they should be done properly see when you do work as a puja would you would want to do the puja halfway because i'm practicing attachment and detachment now i'm doing the puja halfway and i'm going to detach now from it no that's disastrous the puja also has to be done with tremendous focus and finished uh, as prescribed similarly all work has to be done now i am doing work as worship my whole focus is actually ultimately god even though in the time of work i'm not thinking about god if i'm fo- focusing entirely on the work i will think about about the work somebody gave a very beautiful example how can i think of god if i'm thinking of my work all the time and the answer was very beautiful um god is not in your mind your mind is required for the work god is in your heart so a mother loves her child tremendously and is very busy with work to take care of the child and may not be thinking directly of the child but it's always in the background so all the um, cooking cleaning um, everything that i'm doing is for the baby and that's the focus so the lord is what i love and for the lord here is this work i'm doing so in, for example let me tell you what we do in the order as monks so my attitude is when i am getting up in the morning early morning sitting down and meditating and doing the nama japa i am worshiping my lord but after that when i go to back to my room and chant and study the scriptures it's still about my lord and after that when i go and do um, office work you know i was in a ramakrishna mission school so i'm going and teaching the kids uh, looking after administration office work all of that is still the worship of the same lord and in the evening when i go uh, uh, when I, in the afternoon when i go for food i'm making offerings to the same lord and when i in the evening when i go for arati the same lord is being worshiped with uh, the 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 lamp and the flower and the the fan and everything and the songs and then i meditate on the same lord so the whole all the activities are all about that lord about my god now if i find i want this particular activity then i'm loving the activity more than god uh, you see that can happen so there there it becomes clear so this is karma yoga the focus is on god does not matter so for us it does not matter where we are wherever we are we are in some ashram what work we are doing whatever work we are doing we are doing for sri ramakrishna it could be uh, mental intellectual it could be devotional it could be ritualistic it could be seva here i am teaching vedanta and my brother monks are cooking food and serving the um, you know in, in the lockdown the people in india uh, food is being given as relief activities one is cooking and feeding hungry people one is studying and teaching vedanta but both are worshiping the same lord it's the difference in activity is unimportant so this we can do in our lives all right let me take up a um, couple of verses and then we'll come back to other questions hold on to the questions verse number 31 ye me matam idam nityam anutishthanti manava श्रद्धावंतो अनुसूयंतो मुच्यन्ते तेपि कर्मभि सो दोस पीपल हु प्रैक्टिस हु आर एवर प्रैक्टिसिंग दिस टीचिंग ऑफ माइन 
with faith and without criticism are also freed from the effects of actions ye me matamidam ye manavah all those people so it's a practice which is an impersonal practice it doesn't have to we don't have to subscribe to being a devotee of krishna or a vaishnava or you don't have to be a hindu or a, um man or woman in regard without any regard to caste or gender anybody ye me matamidam ye ye manava whichever any person who practices this teaching um with shraddha with faith see a certain amount of faith is necessary because what happens is um right now we don't see the results it takes some time for the results to come and when it does come the results are internal a purity of mind a growing of a love for uh, god and a kind of calmness with regard to the world ups and downs in the world we 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 don't bother so much so this detachment from the world an attachment to god these will come slowly but it is faith that what is being taught to us it is sri krishna's teaching this is really useful for us i want it this faith it will take me to god realization this sustains us if that faith is not there then um, either we will not even begin to be- do this practice or we will start and stop he says nityam do it consistently it takes time so this attitude has to be cultivated day to day week to week month to month year to year in our life we go on doing this and the results slowly they unmistakable results we will very clearly see within ourselves not obvious to others but within ourselves in our thinking in our behavior patterns these will become more and more clear but until that time shraddha faith in the teachings faith in the teacher is necessary um one of our great monks bhaskareshwaranand i heard i never saw him but i heard he would um, start the bhagavad gita teaching he says that when you study the bhagavad gita you um keep these things in mind keep the prayojana in mind prayojana means what is the benefit to me why am i here so this should vibrate in my mind that i want god realization and why do i want god realization because ultimately i want fulfillment true lasting fulfillment i want to achieve the goal of human life so that's why i'm here for that it's i have a purpose to uh i have a purpose to accomplish um that is my prayojana i am here because i will gain something from it and then also keep in mind that this teaching is given by krishna sri krishna is an avatar an incarnation of god he is not my college professor you know i can just take notes and keep the teachings and it's interesting i can think about it and forget about it no 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 this is among the, the most valuable heritage of humanity the teachings of the great incarnations of god uh, there's nothing more valuable that we have in civilization m- more than this so with this attitude you go into the study of bhagavad gita shraddhavanta anusuyanta uh, anusuya means asuya means criticism cavilling criticism so you might think why would a spiritual practitioner be like this yes spiritual practitioners monks uh, may sometimes be specially vulnerable to this kind of a problem uh, criticizing others finding fault with others fault finding it's a very pleasurable activity uh, when you find fault with other people you know that person is like this and it's a mutually pleasurable thing to come and get, get together and criticize another person why this happens it's actually connected to spiritual life the reason is when we cultivate spiritual life when our aim is very high i want to literally we want to become saints so that's our aim now mind plays a trick what the mind the trick that the mind plays is it looks around oneself and here are all these other so called spiritual people and so they are all we are all in the same boat and they all are trying to be spiritual that's the whole purpose now immediately the mind says look at them they're supposed to be spiritual but they are not spiritual this person is jealous that person is angry this person is greedy that person is you know so and so forth we find immediately start finding faults because 
a high ideal is there, we find ourselves falling short of it, but the trick of the mind is not to look to our own problems. We immediately look into the problems of others. We are all in the same boat. We are all in part of the same struggle. We are trying to become spiritual. Because we are trying to become spiritual, we are continuously falling short. But my own falling short is not clear to me. But what is very clear to me is the falling short of other people, real or imagined. Sometimes it's imagined also. So, and that is very, very harmful for spiritual life. Finding fault, Swami Vivekananda said, weep that, that you find fault with others. Uh, that because the moment we dwell on the faults of others, they enter into our own minds. What we dwell on, the mind absorbs that. Uh, it's one way of not being spiritual. Uh, somebody put, it, it's a very modern phenomenon. When you talk about religion, spirituality, meditation, the idea, especially in our um, advanced societies, what more, what greater place than Manhattan itself? So the idea would be to poo-poo such a thing. Oh, it's new agey. It's all the silly people do these things. We are people of the world, you know, uh, and uh, this is unscientific. This is superstitious. This is silly. So I think David Brooks or somebody commented very beautifully. He said. This is actually, it is actually an excuse not to try for yourself. I don't want to better myself. I don't want to follow any high ideal in life. The only way to do this is to criticize all high ideals in life and show that they are, they are after all not so high after all. You know, so that saves me from the effort of, trying, of having to do anything at all. Um, this is one reason why often idealistic people, um, people in ashrams, spiritual people, truly spiritual people, they also become critical. So we are always warned when we joined the order, we were as young brahmacharis, we are always warned against this fault of, against this problem of fault finding, criticizing others, um, becoming hypercritical of things. This is so bad. In fact, there is a, they call it a psychological game, game not in a good sense, the game of ain't it so bad. Ain't it so bad means to get together and criticize something, somebody, um, your, um, whatever that you would all like to get together and hate. And the game is, ain't it so bad? Everybody agrees. This person, this thing, this situation, isn't it so bad? And there's a pleasure associated with it. That is very harmful for spiritual life. And Sri Krishna says, Anasui Yanta, one must be free of this fault of, uh, this fault of fault finding. Guneshu dosha avishkaranam. That is the definition of asuya. Finding fault even when there are good qualities. I have seen one common feature in some of the greatest monks I have met, spiritual practitioners, you know, advanced senior monks. One thing is, a, a common characteristic, I would say even inability to see the faults of others. I have seen. They immediately see the good points in others and refuse to see the bad things about others. It may, to us, it may seem um, escapist or it may seem, you know, he's not realistic. Well, we are very realistic. We immediately see the worst in others. We are very eager to see that. Uh, that is, actually, we are dwelling in a, uh, in a world of Maya. Uh, you see, it is that if it is true that all are Brahman, that the ultimate reality of everybody and everything is God, then ultimately it is all good really. It has to be. So if we see it as bad, we are seeing the surface. We are not seeing in depth. And these, um, I've seen so many. One, let me give you a couple of examples. Um, Swami Ranganathanandaji, who was the 13th president of our order. Um, so he was extremely positive about everything and everybody. Uh, a senior monk told me this, that, uh, um, and Swami Ranganathan used to read very extensively. Anything that you give him, he will, actually, he will at least take a look. So this monk told me that it's um, uh, exhausting going to the Swami, you know, but he will, uh, we have so many publications from so many ashrams, souvenirs, little magazines which are published, um, and they all send a copy to the president of the order. And he will take a look at everything. He may not read everything word by word. It's impossible. But he will take a look sincerely. And he will hand it out to the monks who come. Take a look at this. Tell me what you think of it. And the Swami says, it's, 
you can't lie and say that I read it because you have you have to read it. So when you go back, um, so he would give these things to me that senior Swami told me. These magazines, so these general ordinary publications from our many ashrams. Tell me what you think about it. And the next day I would go back and the Swami Ranganathanji would ask, so did you read it? What did you think about it? So I said, the monk told me, I said to him, Swami is a very uh, ordinary, uh, you know, commonplace article. There's nothing particularly good about it. And Swami Ranganathan, nothing particularly remarkable about it. Swami Ranganathanji would become grave. He wouldn't say anything. He would sit, sit quietly and look away. And this Swami said, until I realized what was wrong. And then I changed my approach. After all, anything published by our ashrams, there will be a few quotes, no matter how poorly done or whatever it is, there will be a few nice quotes from Swami Vivekananda or Sri Ramakrishna or something other, something, generally it will be related to something nice. So I picked out those. The next time the Swami asked me, I said, look, he has chosen wonderful quotes from Sri Ramakrishna. Immediately Swami Ranganathanji's face lit up and he said, yes, he should be encouraged. This is a very good job. You see, whatever little is good in something immediately encourages that. Holy Mother, we read of this lady who has written her reminiscences of Holy Mother and uh, somebody had given a clock and the Holy Mother couldn't figure out how this thing worked. And this girl, she knew how to wind up the clock and she did that. And the Masharada praised her no hand. Look how intelligent she is. She knows how the clock works and, and she went on praising her to everybody. Now it's a small thing, but this is how uh, they encourage and they, um, it leads to development and it leads to, leads to moral, emotional, intellectual and ultimately spiritual development. I have seen this um, in my own experience as a young monk. The senior monks would always try to nurture. Some were affectionate and encouraged us in this way. Some were strict and encouraged us through scoldings. But always the idea was our welfare. Not a sentimental love, not a goody-goody kind of love, just our welfare so that we do better. Uh, I remember another senior monk, Upen Maharaj Swami um, Nitya Muktananda. He was nearly 100 when this thing happened, uh, this, this incident. There was a dramatic performance um, and of some religious theme. I've forgotten what it was. And we went to see that. That was just near, our, near the main ashram, main monastery. And it was really poor. I mean, I can tell you that now. See, I'm criticizing, but it was, it was poor, poor. It was not very well done. It was an amateur group. And, and we were all uh, laughing and criticizing and we came out. And the old Swami also came out and we um, asked him, Swami, did you, what did you think of it? And he looked at its beaming face. Marvelous, wasn't it? Wasn't it marvelous? How wonderfully done. What, I mean, how they played the role of, um, you know, I don't know, it was Sri Ramakrishna, Swami Vivekananda, something like that. Now, he really thinks it was good. Why? Because he sees the, the nobility in the parts that were played. The particular way it was acted or the how they delivered their dialogue, that is secondary to him. It's not that he did not see the fault that we saw, but it's immaterial. The, the message of Sri Ramakrishna or Vivekananda, that's so glorious and so wonderfully uh, expressed. And that is what all that he, he wants to see. And he said, marvelous, wasn't it? And we sort of were a little ashamed and we sort of nodded and <laughs> we backed off immediately. Um, Anusuya, this attitude of criticism, just the opposite of that. I, I remember, I was pretty critical. Um, I hope I am not so much critical now, but I was when I was a, a young novice. And I still remember I was in front of the main temple at Belurmat. There was this old Swami who has passed away now. Um, Uma Nathananda, I think, yeah. Very funny old son, very highly talented. He was a wonderful painter, singer, and so on and so forth. And very humorous. So I used to talk with him. And he was very friendly with the younger, uh, with everybody, with monks of all ages. And he would walk with uh, two sticks because he had poor sense of balance in his old age. 
we had two walking sticks and uh, he would walk. And an example of his humor, when I, he knew that I liked Vedanta, so when he saw me, he would peer at me and he would say, Soyam Atma Chatushpa, the Atma has four legs. From the Madhukya Upanishad, the four aspects of the Atman, waker, dreamer, deep sleeper and the Turiya. So two legs and two, two walking sticks. Soyam Atma Chatushpa. Um, so one day, I went to him and asked him, uh, I was just grumbling. Why? I've forgotten what I was grumbling about. This is not good and it should, this should be like that and that should be like that. And why is this happening? He peered at me and suddenly he said, Hush! Shh! I was surprised. What? I was a novice in white dress. He said, first complete the course, 10 years until you become a monk. Till that time keep your mouth shut. <laughs> Listen and learn and mature in spiritual life. Complete the course 10 years later, then what you say, right now what you say is not worth listening to. <laughs> and it was so, um, it was such a great lesson, you know. Uh, I reminded him of that. The day I got our mon monastic vows at the end of the 10 years, uh, the day I became a monk, the next day in the morning, the, one of the rituals is to go around to all the senior monks and bow down and tell your name. That's a good way of memorizing your name. So if you go and tell your name to 100 people, bow down and tell your name. And the juniors, those who are the novices who are not yet sannyasis, they come and bow down to you and ask you your name. So you have to tell them your name. So if you tell your name two or three hundred times in one day, you remember it from, from the <laughs> absolutely. So I bowed down to him and I said, my name is uh, Sarva Priyananda. And then I, rem then I told him, Maharaj, several years ago, you remember what you taught me and he had forgotten. I told him that I was grumbling and criticizing this and that and he and you s scolded me and he said, um, keep quiet until complete the course, 10 years, become a monk, then only open your mouth. And by that time, I'd completely forgotten what I was critical about and what I was complaining about is all gone. So you see all these things we get upset about, how small they are. Within a few days, within a few months, as time changes, you completely forget. You remember you were upset. But what it was you were upset about is completely gone. Um, in fact, when you are upset, if, if we misbehave with others, if we say hurtful words with, to others, out of a sense of righteous indignation maybe, Years later, the tragedy is, we have, we have totally forgotten what is it that we were indignant about, what is it that we are so mad about, but we do not forget that we hurt somebody. That still remains with us. So it's very wise not to lash out in anger or in criticism, because that stays and it hurts us more than, that person might have forgotten, but we remember. Anusuyantaha. Mutyate tepi karma bhi. These are also freed from the effects of karma. Effects of karma ultimately by purification of mind, concentration of mind and realization that I am Brahman, they are free ultimately from the cycle of karma. Let's do one more verse. Just the op opposite. Those who do not follow my teaching. Yetve tadabhyasu yanto Nanutishthanti me matam sarva jnana vimuranstan vidhi nashtana jetasa. On the contrary, those who criticize this teaching of mine and do not practice it, uh, no such fools to be bereft of all knowledge, to be doomed. So, a dire warning. Who find fault with this teaching? Could be in different ways. Um, that sometimes people say, why should I follow this? Uh, I know something better. I am Brahman. Or that might be one, one thing. Or uh, it could be that, uh, no, uh, I am going to do work for my own gain. What is this working for the welfare of others and working as a worship of God? I don't believe in God. Well, then we'll, keep, we'll be trapped in the cycle of karma. Um, all that we do is either ultimately for God realization or it will take us to samsara. There is, there is no other alternative. Anything else, good or bad, that we do in samsara will take us towards samsara. It will perpetuate this life after life, this cyclic existence. But if we, dive, if we channelize our actions through karma yoga, it will take us 
away from samsara. It will free us from samsara and take us Godward. Godward. Sarva jnana vimudang. They are deluded in all kinds of knowledge. Paravidya, paravidya. Um, in relative terms and in ultimate terms. What does it mean? Not only they are ultimately deluded about what I am and what I am not. Atma and Atma. That I am pure consciousness. I am not body and mind. That clarity will never come to such people. They will keep getting involved with, you know, mixed up with this body-mind complex. But also, at a more practical level, dharma, dharma, what is to be done, what is not to be done, that also the, uh, these people get mixed up with. Because such people are driven by um, their raga dvesha, likes and dislikes, by their preferences. Um, this is, seems to be good for me, I'm going to do this good for me in a, in a worldly sense. And that I don't like. I'm going to avoid that. And that's my purpose in life. God, uh, if God can help me in this, he's welcome. If not, I can dispense with God. And we are trapped in samsara. Uh, what is to be done, what is not to be done, that, that discrimination is lost. Why does this happen? Achetasaha. See, it goes back to that same crux in 30th verse we saw. Achetasaha means lacking the spiritual consciousness. Only when we have this, first of all, had this high goal, the purpose of human life is God-realization. If I do not believe that, if I do not accept that, even theoretically, then I'm going to go into samsara. I'll be trapped in samsara. Ram Sukhdasji points out in his commentary one interesting point, matam. The word matam means opinion or view. And Sri Krishna here, he says, ma- matam, ma- matam idam, me matam, my opinion or view, my teaching. And Ram Sukhdas, he points out, look at the humility of the Lord. He could have said Siddhanta means the ultimate conclusion, the final truth, the teaching. He says, no, this is my view. I'm just throwing out a suggestion. You can follow it if you like. But it's just my view. This whole Karma Yoga teaching... He says, me matam, my, t- my particular view. Um, there are all this range of views before you. Uh, the materialist says something, the revolutionary says something else, the intellectual says something else. And here is this teaching I am giving to you. Consider it. If you think it's worthwhile, you can follow it. Me matam. In- so Ram Sukhdasji points out, instead of saying Siddhanta, Siddhanta means final conclusion. This is the teaching, ultimate truth. I am God, the incarnation of God. Here I am telling you. No. Me matam. My, my opinion, my, my view is this. Um, yes. Maras, there are a few questions in the chat. Yes. Uh, first one from Rama. Does developing this attitude that the Lord does everything remove our desires in worldly life? Yes. Definitely, uh, it does. This, this, adi- uh, this idea that everything belongs to the Lord. Not, it is not mine and not for my purposes. This body, this mind, the wealth that I have, the people that are around me, they are not mine. They belong to the Lord. And they are not here for my purposes also. The people are here not here to serve my purpose. This body is also not here to serve my purpose. This mind is also not here to serve my purpose. Then what is all this for? This world, body and mind, it is for God realization. The only purpose that God wants from us, the only thing, the whole purpose of human life is God realization. So when we develop this attitude that the world belongs to God, truly it does. This body belongs to God. My life belongs to God. My thoughts, my knowledge, my devotion, all the things in my mind, they belong to the Lord, not me. It is the Lord's treasure, Lord's possessions, which I have been allowed to use for God realization, not even to achieve my own particular goals, which I might have in mind. See, all those goals that we have in life, education, um, relationships, money, whatever it is, these are all sort of indirect a graduated path towards God realization. They are not ends in themselves. Ram Sukhdasji makes a very interesting point. Why, why will you say that these are not ends in themselves? Money, relationship, uh, success in career, 
So why are these are all things which are considered to be worthwhile? This is what people you know they pursue. Uh, he says, notice they are not ends in themselves because he is tripti uh, abhava. There is no satisfaction in this. Purnata abhava. There is no completion of feeling of fulfillment in these things. They are only temporary and then it goes away. Yet when one attains to God realization or as one moves towards God, grows in devotion and love for God, there is more and more tripti, more and more satisfaction. Purnata, there is more and more fulfillment. This is a sign that all these worldly goals are not the purpose of life. They are not ends in themselves. They may help you to mature. Try this, try that and see, okay, so did not give me fulfillment. Move on, go forward. That much is their use. But God realization is the end in itself because it gives us true satisfaction, lasting satisfaction immediately. Even the ultimate God realization, Samadhi, Brahma, Jnana, whatever it is, that may be a far cry. But right now, little bit of feeling for God, a little peaceful repetition of the repetition of the mantra, a little act of service done to somebody and mentally offering to it to my beloved, my Lord, and this is for you. You see the immediate pure peace it gives. Even a small burst of gladness and joy it gives to you immediately. He says that is the sign that God realization, spirituality is the goal. Everything is for that. Yes. Maharaj, there is one more. Yes. From, from Ramya. Uh, what if there are some unintended errors in something done? Can it still be offered? Ah, very good question. Because any kind of worldly activity, errors will spoil everything. So, whether it's some worldly job, if you do something wrong, your boss is going to scold you. Um, if it's a puja, which is done, a ritual, done for some worldly goal, I want something in this world, it could be money, success or whatever. Unless the ritual is done perfectly, no result will come. It has to be done properly. But, the interesting thing is, if you offer something to the Lord, it may be deficient in certain ways. Maybe I don't know the mantras properly. Or maybe I, I, uh, my meditation was not perfect. Or maybe I, I, it was still um, some, in some way deficient. But if I offer it to the Lord with love, then all the deficiencies are removed. Sri Krishna, uh, I mean the Gita makes it very clear that uh, anything done for God, the deficiencies are removed. You will not suffer for any shortcomings there. That gives result. Not only that, anything else, worldly activity, you in agriculture or business, you do something halfway and abandon it, then no result will come. It will be a total loss. But for God, whatever little you do, the result is bound to come. Sri Krishna says in the sixth chapter, nothing is lost in this path. What a, what a great thing. In this path, as much progress as you make, that is permanent progress. It will help you next life also. If we do not attain God realization, Arjuna asked, suppose I do not attain enlightenment in this life. So, do I begin all over again next life? That seems like such a bore. Um, Sri Krishna says, no, nothing is lost. This is such a wonderful path. Whatever we do is, is permanently yours. And to whatever extent we progress, next life you start from there. So, unintended errors, especially unintended er errors are there in any kind of worship, uh, ritualistic worship or any service that we do, whatever it is. Um, no harm. Of course, when we are offering something to God, we will make the we will be careful. If you offer something to uh, someone who is very beloved to you, wouldn't you be careful? You you make an effort to make sure everything goes well, everything is done nicely. So when we offer something to the Lord, we make an extra effort to make sure everything is done nicely. But even then, if there are some um, unintended deficiencies, shortcomings. There is absolutely need not be afraid at all. In many of the Hindu rituals in the pujas, at the end there will be a verse. There will be verses for asking for forgiveness, uh, forgiveness for this deficiency and that deficiency, and the Lord forgives. All Next, right. Last one, Maharaj, hmm. from Devanik. Uh, should we have a goal when we when we embark on any job 
and is focusing on the goal considered an attachment to the goal or outcome as i said every work has its own internal logic so you're going to do an assignment or a project for a company of course you must um, complete the project um, uh, meet the deadline write a proper report these are all part of the puja which you are doing to the lord so they must be done well so no the lord said if there's some deficiency he will forgive it he might but your boss won't forgive it so uh, whatever has to be done has to be done properly so any kind of activity you start definitely has to have a goal every activity has a goal so at the level of the activity there will be a goal but remember overall our goal is god realization because we are mumukshus we are spiritual seekers and therefore even in worldly activities whether it's uh, taking care of the children their education whether it's uh, a job um, there are goals to be achieved there and anybody who is who has common sense who is competent will certainly have clear ideas about what he or she is doing but that's at the level of the of the activity overall the purpose is i am serving my lord in this way that is the overall objective yeah uh, i think somebody has raised the hand yes yeah uh unam you are next please go ahead pranam swami ji namaskar yes swami ji to develop this adhyatma chetsa the ritualistic worship is helpful or essential ritualistic worship is it helpful for this adhyatma chetasa the spiritual attitude the spiritual attitude is actually more of a decision the ritualistic worship is it helpful yes but the problem is many people have a ritualistic worship which becomes a mechanical worship over years of practice you know and there is no spirit behind it and they may be stuck there so we must consciously take a step we have already taken a step don't worry <laughs> we are all uh, spiritual seekers but let's admit it to ourselves that my primary goal is god realization the more i move towards god realization more i'm moving towards my goal and it will prevent confusion i know now what i want in life i'm moving towards that so my success and failure will be measured internally for me um, in terms of my progress towards god realization other things will all be there um, a monk will have the ashram to look after um, a householder will have the family and job to look after those things will be there they are the particulars of your sadhana the instruments of your sadhana uh, but it is a conscious decision i want god realization do i want dharmartha kama or do i want moksha i want moksha dharmartha kama are still there but they will serve the purpose of taking me towards moksha very good i think we have run o- over time please take care everybody uh, let me do the shanti om shanti 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 hari om tat sat shri ram krishna arpana mastu stay safe take care i'm looking at all of you in the this uh, gallery view it's very nice you can see everybody yes very good take care i think i can see prakhyat in belur math <laughs> all right jai ram krishna take care